Hello everyone and welcome to episode 21 of the Power of Books. It has been a while, but we are back with more interviews and more episodes. My name is Timo Jübner, I'm the founder of Timo's Notes, and in this show I interview popular non-fiction authors about their best-selling books. The goal of the show is to introduce you to new books and to provide you with actionable advice and tools to live a better life, and occasionally I share a few of my insights on reading and books. My guest today is Tim Castle. Tim is an entrepreneur, mindset coach, and best-selling author. He has developed his sales and negotiation skills from decades of experience in bartering and sales. Therefore, he's also a sought-after sales and negotiation trainer for startups and corporates, working with founders, elite athletes, and business moguls. His previous books, The Art of Negotiation and Be the Lion, have helped thousands of people across the world. In the Momentum Sales Model, Tim shares the strategies for creating sales momentum, which he has developed and refined for himself and for the countless clients he has worked with. From our conversation, you can expect to learn how you can set yourself apart from your competition, how to handle losing a sale, how to foster great relationships with clients, and a lot more. So now... Without further ado, let's get into our conversation. Enjoy the show. Tim Castle, welcome to the Power of Books podcast. I'm excited to have you on today. Thanks so much, Timo. I'm, I'm overwhelmed and, and loving life and ready to be here. Thank you so much. Very grateful to be on your show today. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, we're going to talk about your book, The Momentum Sales Model, today. First and foremost, we're not going to only talk about that, but it's the most important topic we'll cover. So um, uh, can you give the listeners like a brief intro? What is the book about? So they get the context of what we're going to talk about. Yeah, I, I think like the main emphasis of the book is like ge in general, obviously, as the title says, how to create momentum in the world of sales. But if you're just an ambitious person that's out there, a go-getter, someone that needs to influence people, if you're starting a business, And maybe you haven't got a sales background, or even if you have, even if you're just a struggling salesperson, you're like, look, I've got some very ambitious goals. This book's going to be for you because what I recognize, and not to go too long on this first answer is, but the traditional sales model or how sales training is done doesn't actually set you up for too much success when you actually have a problem of, I just don't know how to create momentum. Momentum is the biggest thing that you can create that gets you going and starts. When you get consistency and the ability to create momentum, you can take that into any business, any product, any economy, and you can you have it within you. So it's something, it's a skill that you've learned and you take that with you rather than just being able to say, do one aspect of it really well, like pitching. But then is that really sales? Is that really creating momentum? Does that, you know what I mean? When that one tactic doesn't work, you're left with a target that you still have to hit and it causes issues. And so what I really wanted to do, and based on my over 15 years leading businesses and expanding them into different territories and market, was basically put down what I coach and what my online courses coach, which is sales and, and how to do that. So in essence, it's for the ambitious entrepreneur. That could be you just starting out in business. It could be you at all levels. I have people that I coach that are doing millions of dollars in, in business and mm -hmm. they all need to be able to generate momentum it doesn't matter the level that you're playing at you've still got to be able to generate momentum and you still have ambitious goals so this is what that book's for it is a bit of a beast but i i believe the reason it's a beast is because i wouldn't let the editors cut anything out because it, everything <laughs> has a piece of importance in it and it's an acronym right so momentum is actually an acronym for the framework that that we can go into detail in a bit later but it's It's, it's a joy to share that work, to be honest, um, and because it, and it, it comes from the heart and it comes from experience. So I've been there in the trenches. It's not just like I'm making this stuff up from lectures or textbooks. This is actual strategies that have been proven to get success in the field that I've used myself. So that was kind of like the, the thinking behind the book. Love that. Love that answer. And I wanted to touch on, because you said it, like you're 
like you learned this from experience not just from textbooks so the next thing i kind of wanted to get into to learn a little more about your background your personal story like how did you get into sales like did you know that you want to do this or did you kind <laughs> yeah. of end up in the field or how did it happen yeah i think i grew up like when i grew up i was i always wanted to be an on like an entrepreneur an inventor i think i want to be an inventor and or a traveler like an adventurer Mm. And I used to read books like Pole to Pole by Michael Palin or books where they would just go into like the unknown in South America and start exploring and they'd have to work their way back. And so I had this really deep like yearning to want to go and explore and to go and, and to invent things. So I'd spend loads of hours tinkering with radio controlled cars and putting them back together, taking things apart. And I'm not, I'm going to relate this to sales in a minute, but what that got me to do was to basically follow the passions and to follow what I was good at. So I went through life, basically started off in a corporate barter agency. And, and that was just basically waking up every day and negotiating and having these, it was like a dream job, to be honest, where you're waking up and you're having these conversations and you're doing all of these deals every day. You're doing like 20 deals a day. And if you haven't come across barter before, essentially what you're doing is you're exchanging one product or service for another product or service. But what you have to do is you have to obviously negotiate on either side of the deal. Because if you're taking a deal where it's Jaguar Land Rovers on one side and you're swapping it for, I don't know, millions of dollars of outdoor advertising space, if you haven't got the maths right, if you haven't got the negotiations right, you're going to be ending up with the cars that cost you more money than you can actually sell them for or the space that you bought, the inventory that you've got being sold at a cost that actually doesn't make you any money. So it gets you thinking in new creative ways. And so having, I guess, a real understanding of myself and understanding, right, okay, I'm someone that likes to explore the world. I like to do, make inventions. I feel like I had, I had a lawn mowing business when I was young, at age 15, and I started off doing painting fences and had all of these different side projects and businesses. And, and I guess I lived in this, at, at sort of 24 years old, I lived in this world where I was doing kind of what I wanted to be doing, negotiating every day, making money. It seemed great. And then after about seven or eight years of doing that, you kind of reach a point where you're like, well, what am I going to do, right? Am I either going to go and set up my own firm doing this, mm. which for me, I didn't really want to do because I'd be competing with people that had become my friends, right? This was a very close-knit company. It was a privately held company. We'd been on a really big success run in the UK and Australia and all the markets that I'd kind of gone to. And so I didn't really fancy doing that because I'd be going head to head with people that I'd, I'd built deep relationships with. But what I did fancy doing was getting into, into sales. But this is where it comes, right? Because basically I'd done nearly a decade in one pathway mm. and I just was switching in. I had to learn a whole new industry. And so I had all of the kind of sales courses and I had to go on all of these courses with the job, right? You get offered all of these brilliant courses and then you, you think that you're going to be able to go do it. But what you realize is they're not so brilliant. And so you actually end up having to learn or I had to learn the strategies myself. And these are strategies like things like find the best person in the company and literally go take them out to lunch every day for a month and just, just shadow them. Don't be afraid because there'll, there'll be people and salespeople that are working in companies now that someone is killing it in that business, but you're not spending any time with them. And it's like, they have the answer. They, they know what they're doing. So you need to put yourself in proximity with those people and literally go into those meetings, record them on your phone. I mean, it's probably a little bit unethical, but like, this is what it takes to win. And you need to absorb how they say things. And then you need to put your own spin on it. And you need to kind of get it to a point where you can subconsciously just unload what the best in the business do and then put your own kind of style on it. And this is what I did from the ground up because I was really paying my own way. I was paying to play. I was going out trying to get all this training and it just wasn't improving me. And I was going into situations and I was rubbish. I was rubbish because I, I was used to negotiating really big deals. So I just thought, right, sales, it's all about you just have to get the meeting. And then once you get the meeting, you just sort of tell the story a bit and we'll, we'll get there and we'll do a deal. And what ends up happening because it was outside of my wheelhouse Potentially, it's not like that because certain companies have certain ways that they like you to do things. And then you're like, hang on, I don't really want to just go and take them through this overview of my company and do all of this rubbish. I just want to get to the, the deal. I want to sell. And so for me, I had to take a step back 
and I had to really think about my own journey in sales. And I had to, and it wasn't until I started to run companies or started to go and take companies that were either basically like a startup or they had a market that they were having trouble in or a whole region. And I could, I could basically apply what I now teach. It's funny how it goes, life goes all the way around, but now I go in and teach yeah. startups and companies how to sell. But at that time, because I was like, nobody had too much expectation because they were like, well, this is either going to work or it's not in this company, but we need it to work. But to be honest, it's not the best product or it's not the best situation or we don't have resource or the, all the things, all the shiny things that we have in the US or over here, you don't have. So it's just you go and see what you can sell. But because of that, it's kind of like you can try all of these innovative strategies. And, and because I had this motivation to write, well, the traditional sales models working, the training that I'm receiving, and this is back like a few a decade ago. So it's a bit different now, I think, where you've got podcasts and YouTube and there's some great, great sales trainers. So this is nothing to say about what's going on today. It's just mm -hmm. back then I, I couldn't find access to it or even I wasn't self-aware aware enough to be able to do it. Um, but now, obviously, working and, and living in that field, I know I can definitely point you to some really great sales trainers that are out there that that are talking the business, that know exactly what they're talking about. And, they, and there's so much good resources out of there. But anyway, so because I was in these companies that I, I got the privilege to expand these companies, I got the privilege and the responsibility to do that. It put me in a very interesting position where, for me, the way I viewed it was, well, I have something of, of value here to offer. So it's my duty to go out and talk to these people. If I believe that my product and that I can help you, then I have something of value. And therefore, it's my duty to go talk to you. And at the same time, it's all upside. It's exponential upside because no one's been into this territory before. Or they've got a problem. Say it was a company I was working for and they've got a problem and they haven't managed to do revenue and they've been in the market for a few years and it's struggling. And they're like, we're going to shut this thing down if you can't turn it around. Well, it's all asymmetric upside then. You just go into that. And because you bring all of your strategies and because I brought all the things that I'd learned on the ground, I was able to kind of move the needle. And once I did that, I realized the importance of momentum. And I came up with my framework called Momentum Sales Model out of that. It was born out of how do you move something from, say, zero to $5 million in revenue? Mm. And how do you do it quickly when you've got pressures and you maybe don't have all of the nice shiny tools and, and, and products that, other markets have but you have to still make the revenue right you still have to to move and so that's how i got into sales it was a bit accidental but it was a bit um if i look back i can always see it was coming in it it was just that i was coming in at a very senior level later on in the career it's not like i started off in sales from like exact like a junior level i was going in at a sort of a director level and mm. then up to president and higher so that's where um my journey went and now i mean i love sales i love i love it because it's it's something that comes through i believe when you have competence you have competent confidence so the confidence comes because you're not worried about the the meeting or the, whether the sale's going to happen or not you've got none of that because you're there to to add value you're actually there to qualify if you can even help them and i think that's just taking it a step back even more it's like look we have to actually define whether we can even help you here like i'm not even sure and that just changes the game, right? Because you're not there like, oh, counting your commission and, oh, we need to sell you to make these targets. It's no, we're going to find the right right clients in the right way. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a beautiful journey. That's amazing. And we can definitely feel your energy and the fact that you love sales. So, and, and I think it's, it's exciting <laughs> to hear because yeah. I, I didn't know you've been in like, because mainly as you explained that the job in bartering was like negotiation and you wrote your first book about negotiations. I think that's also a valuable yeah. skill set that you brought into the world of sales, oh, which yeah. already gave you like a head start basically. So that's, that's amazing. As you said, I, I, like momentum sales model is an acronym and I want to dive into the first letter, which is M, which is for mindset. And one thing that stood out to me or that I found interesting is you talk about it's important as a salesperson or an entrepreneur in general to be resourceful. Uh, like what does that mean and how can people make sure that they are resourceful? Yeah, I think resourcefulness is at the crux and the heart of being a true salesperson. It's, 
the ability to go out there and create new situations, new relationships, new contacts, new introductions. Like every interaction you're going into, you should be aiming to get one referral, one cross sell, one new action, one next step. I call it the one, 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 four ones, right? Every single one, because actually in these meetings, the number of people that are asking for referrals is super low. It's about 11%, whereas 91% of clients and people out there would make referrals. And the fact is, no one's doing it. No one's asking for referrals consistently. They might remember just because they've listened to this podcast that they should be asking for referrals. But the problem is they're going out there and they're doing it for a week. They're not doing it for 52 weeks in a year. So when you start becoming a resourceful person in sales, like the sky is literally the limit because you're able to go out there and you're able to think, right, well, I've committed. I'm all in. I'm going to meet this person, this person, this person, this person. I don't mind how long it takes. I've just got to come up with creative ways to cut through the noise and to not act like every other salesperson. And how do you do that? Well, you've got to focus on what's in it for them. You've got to focus on the fact that you bring value and you've got to keep that attitude because it's all about your attitude focused on the value that you can create. And the fact is you have got value to offer. You definitely have. You're out there selling You've got a value to offer else. What, what are you even doing in the market? What are you even doing if the product that you're working for or the company that you're working for, you don't believe in? It's not going to work. You're ambitious. You have a great product. You have a situation where you want to go out there and you want to you want to move mountains. You want to move hearts and minds and, and be able to educate people and bring them on the journey. And that comes through the power of story. But you've got to be able to connect through to what matters to them. So you've got to think from their perspective. Mm-hmm. What is it? that they're coming up against? What what are their challenges? What are their problems? And how can you fit into those problems without just going, well, my problem, I need to make commission and target is super important. How can they, if they feel that from you, they're put off straight away. So it's all about energy. It's all about mindset and being able to think about it. Well, hey, hang on. We don't even know if we we should be doing business right, right yet. So let's just explore. Let's get that first meeting. Let's not put the cart before the horse. Let's just get in the door. So a lot of being resourceful and a lot of creating momentum comes from having the habit of being someone that's not afraid to look and and be in uncomfortable positions, to go and cold call on people, actually physically go to their office and say, hey, I really wanted to meet you. I'm here because I care and I have something that I believe if we can just sit for five minutes that actually will add a lot of value to your business. And it's, it's this mindset of someone that thinks that they're being really annoying that then stops them from actually taking action and doing it. Whereas the real mm-hmm. winners are able to get over that, override that mindset piece and have the attitude of someone that has a lot of value. And that comes down to your self identity. And I learned this the hard way, but I learned it. And in my book, Be the Lion, I mean, that book is all about self transformation and self identity. But I learned that everything comes back to that self identity piece. And in sales, it's massive because really if you're acting as the person you want to become and you've got this identity of someone that that has value to offer that is a great person just just by being you you're a great person to know you're a connector you're able to even do referrals to your competitors because you're not even necessarily if it's right for the client and you haven't got the right product refer it to a competitor they will actually see Mm -hmm. that you're not afraid of competition they will actually see that you're genuinely trying to help them and you will build a better long-term relationship with that person that they'll go, hey, that's someone I want to do business with. This might not be the right situation, but that's definitely someone that I want to do business with. And that is worth its weight in gold rather than trying to be fearful and going, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to refer business or I want to slag off the competition because I'm so scared that they're going to come and take on my clients. It's like, oh my goodness, that's filled with fear. So having that attitude of someone that you know just through the, the process just through applying the momentum sales model, that you can take that into any business, any economy, any situation, and you can climb that mountain. And because you're consistently disciplined to climb the mountain and put the things, the strategies for success and explosive growth that are in there into play, once you start activating those, you you activate your success mechanism within, within yourself and you start to expect wins. You start to expect, and because your pipeline is getting bigger, because you're having all of these amazing conversations, you're not going into any conversation that potentially could be quite difficult. I mean, I've been on the other side of some really tough negotiations, but the best way 
to handle that because you're doing multiple negotiations a day and multiple sales a day. You can go into those bigger conversations. It's not a loss to you if it doesn't work. You don't feel the loss because you've got, you're not scrabbling to, to fill that hole in your pipeline. You're like, no, we've got it covered. But if this isn't the right piece of business to do, then, then we don't have to do it. That's totally fine. Like, and so that's a completely different energy. And so becoming resourcefulness is like, is major, is, is major. Like being able mm. to get referrals out of each meeting, being able to consistently define next steps that are actual next steps and get action taking steps on them, get cross sales in, start planting those seeds for what other things that might come down the line and bring someone into that vision. It's, it's almost magical when it happens because there's, it's, it's almost effortless in that way because it's just flowing out of someone. When you're sat next to a top seller doing that, you know that they're creating magic. It's, I love it because it's so, mm. it's so fun to be around, but it's also fun for the clients because they're not, they can see transparently that you're not there. Yeah, you're going to make money, but you're not there. That's not your first and foremost purpose for being in that room. And it's, that's what it comes down to. Mm. Yeah, because they can sense your intention, as you explained. Like if you're in it for the wrong things and they will feel that and not end up doing business with you. And yeah, I mean, from what you explained, it also sounds like most people are not doing that. And that's exactly why you can set yourself apart with that. So that's really interesting. Another important factor when it comes to the mindset you talk about in the book is how people should deal with losing a sale or how they handle it because that's often something that holds people back when they you know lose a sale and then they have negative feelings maybe forget about the value or don't believe in the value of themselves and their product or service anymore and they take it with them into the next sale and then they show up differently so how do you handle that oh my goodness simo yeah this is a huge one like people take it so personally when they lose a sale and they it's it's rejection right and and it's what does rejection actually mean to you? So you've got to reframe what rejection is. Re re rejection is just redirection, right? It's just knocking on a door and not right now, right? Handle it with grace. That's my top tip. Handle that with grace. When someone is saying not right now to you, cool. That's all good. Be be a higher standard because everybody else, that is a, it's basically a test. It's a time to show what standard do you play at? Because you can still surprise and delight that customer, that even though they didn't sell with you. You can still try and help their business out, even though they didn't sell, go go with you on that sale. Because remember, that client that they chose to, that deal that they chose to do may fall through. Things always come around. It's cyclical. Like a couple of years down the line, that client might move business. And then suddenly they actually do want to do business and they love the way that you handled yourself just because they don't do business with you. doesn't mean the relationship's over. doesn't mean they can't refer you to other clients. doesn't mean they can't be a testimonial for you. doesn't mean that they can't be an advocate for your business, but the number one thing and you hit on it, Timo is you do not want to carry that victim mentality into your other sales because this is where the gold is. And you're bringing in something that's like needy and desperate and that vibe ain't going to work over here. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to go in and you're going to go in all pissed off and annoyed and annoyed at yourself and doubting yourself and like, oh, maybe we haven't got as good a product as we thought. Maybe we're not uh, meant to be doing this. You start literally, I've seen it, entrepreneurs that are this close to landing massive, massive clients. And they're, they're literally about to throw in the towel because one client said, no, oh no, we shouldn't, we, maybe we shut up shop. We haven't got any more fun. And you're like, mate, seriously? You're this close. You're this close to a breakthrough, but you've got to keep going. And the real part of this and why the momentum sales model is so important is because if you've put the process in, you wouldn't be worried in the first place. And you'd understand that that fear that you're bringing into your new clients, that needy desperation victim kind of mode is killing everything. It's just, you're just killing all the rest of the opportunities and you're not handling it with grace. So handle it with grace, go and win that relationship, wish them well on your, like I'm here if you need me, love what you're doing we'd love to work we don't even need to lose touch just every quarter still touch base still check in but don't get caught up in it move on you've got all of this great business to do over here and there's an abundance of business so you've got to have cat faith and it's got to be part of who you are because that's what you've got to, that is the reality you've got to be cut out for that because that's the reality it's not that we go in and we win 100 percent of every single deal and we never we can't face rejection that's not a winner that's not someone that's actually a top salesperson. The top sellers are getting rejected, but they're turning the rejection and it's fueling them even more, 
right? They're performing at a higher standard even when they get rejected. It's making them improve even more. And that's when you use it as fuel to go harder. And it, yeah, it's just next level. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And I wanted to actually ask if you still follow up with those people and like, what do you say? Or like, what do you try to get out of a follow-up if you follow up in the next quarter, as you said? Yeah, I mean number one thing is don't make it awkward don't make it mm. awkward like it's like going after an ex per, an ex-girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend <laughs> some, or someone that don't, that don't make it awkward you're not there to like oh how's it going it's a check-in like hey ha like how's the family going? like you're doing it because you genuinely want to create a relationship and you genuinely want them to succeed and through that genuine connection they will reveal details that will be of value to you and remember every every client No matter if they've been with a, a customer, has been with a with a, a business for 20 years, they they do have pain points. And if yeah. if you really want to win in sales, you're it's the questions that you're asking that's going to help them understand and identify those pain points and bring them out and draw them out and actually under help them understand that actually, yeah, well, oh, this is a pain point. What do you mean we can fix this? Like, what do you oh, and then they start questioning it and It's not that you need to go in there and just be like, hey, how's it going? I've heard that they suck. And uh, we told you that would be rubbish. That was a bad idea. You're not there to do that. You're there to build a genuine connection. And through that, you can start speaking to the pain points through the lens of how you see it. You're not there to badmouth the competition or say that they, they they've made that decision. So if you're going in and saying, hey, didn't work out for you, did it? Like, that's not a great relationship. That's like mm. punching your friend in the, in the face. Like it doesn't work like that. You create the connection, focus on the good that you can give and just showing up as yourself authentically. And, and that's the way to do it. And through that, it's actually just the consistency piece. The fact that you do do it for the right reasons means that you can be consistent. You can invite them to your events. You can update them with what you're doing. I think that's a, a good way. It's just, hey, thought you'd like this, or I saw that, thought of you. I know you're into this. It doesn't have to even be related to the industry they're in. You just know that person. And the other thing is, is at the top, top levels, CEOs and executives, they're not there. For, they don't need you commenting on their industry. They get so much information. They get so many links. They get so, they're overwhelmed with links. What they need you to do is to understand their, their, their actual business and where they're potentially at risk Where they, where they could be making more money. How is their organization structured? Who are the people? And that comes from you networking across the business and then synthesizing that information and bringing it to them. That is actually helpful for them. Like you're at, you're at risk because you're doing this, 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 this. That's actually like a consultant. That's actually really valuable. How can we make more money? How can we make more profit? Well, that's what they want to know about. That's what they care about. They don't need you there going, I saw this article on Google that anyone could find. And I just Googled it 10 seconds ago and emailed it <laughs> you because I actually just want to find out if you're going to give us that business that we lost six months ago because they can read you like a book. So don't do that. That's that's funny. And it's a great transition to the next point I want to get into. I just quickly want to point out that I love the picture you paint of like, because it's a very positive one about sales. Like as you said, taking care of the customer, understanding their true needs and desires and helping them, actually helping them and not what sales is often perceived as, you know, as trying to mm -hmm. get something out of them. So I love mm -hmm. that. But uh, to transition to the next point is in the chapter, the second chapter or the second part of the model, that's the letter O and it's opportunities. Mm -hmm. And you talk about keeping a day book, which is how you kind of take care of your, or how you keep track of your relationships. And you kind mm -hmm. of explained a little bit what you do, but maybe go a little more into detail. Like what is the day book? Why should people use one? And uh, yeah, just uh, take yeah, care I of it. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this came back from my days in Barter because we were doing a lot of calls, a lot of phone calls, and a lot of the deals would be done on the phone or um, at lunch, right? You'd go, as in London, you'd go to a restaurant and you'd, you'd have these conversations and all the details would be coming out. But if you didn't update your day book, you lost all of that detail. And that detail was the detail you needed six months later when you needed to do another deal. But it's captured in that day book. Like, what are their interests? What are their likes? What are they worried about? What like All of these small, they, they seem insignificant, but really you're building a picture. They help you build a picture of who is this person and what matters to them. And the day book is actually you building a habit in yourself. It's raising your own standard internally for you as to this is how I operate. Because as you grow, 
And as you go and you see multiple people a day, multiple meetings, and this might seem impossible to some people who aren't in sales or even they are in sales and they're like, yeah, like honestly, to for me to get high quality meetings every day, that's a struggle. Well, I, I love business development. That's what I, that's my forte. I absolutely love business development and getting you through the door. And that's what this book will do. But once you've got that problem solved and you've got a full pipeline, the next problem is, is you've got, you actually become a product of, uh, there is a problem of having too much success or too many sales because all this information and details is is flying at you in meeting after meeting after meeting and you need a way to capture it on the fly that's where your day book comes in and you get because you do this it's like anything when you're saving when you don't have money because you do it it becomes a habit so then when you get rich you still do it so you actually save some of your riches it's the same thing when you're not selling very much having this habit of creating a day book and filling it with the right details will help inform how you then connect with people six months later or three months later. And you'll just become this wealth of knowledge and this connector. And you'll be able to go, hang on, I can start to see themes and I can see people that actually would like to get together. And you can start to connect people, which is actually giving value. And then suddenly you become this, this joy to be around this person that people want to hang out with because they know you have valuable contacts and and your status raises. That your influence raises, your ability to persuade raises, you're mm. interesting, you become interesting. That's what they say, right? Don't just be boring. Like, you know, you want to become interesting. And so as you create the habit, as you elevate in your sales career, and as you elevate as an entrepreneur, these details become super important because one, it just takes one little detail and one little link in your head and your, your head can't contain all that information. So by you putting it in as part of your process, you're freeing up space to take details in the next meeting and the next meeting and the next meeting. And this is the consistent detail that requires discipline that is hard work and no one wants to do. Therefore, not mm-hmm. many do it. Therefore, there is only just 1% of top sellers. They're, in a company, one, one, the 1% will be making way more money at multiple X of all the other sellers. There will just be one or... To, like depending on how big the organization is, but they'll be a, they'll be the cream of the crop that are making the big bucks, but they're doing these things and mm. they've got consistency to it and they've got discipline and it's boring, right? <laughs> I'm excited about it because I love sales. I'm not yeah. here to sugarcoat it. You don't want to do this stuff, but you, that's why you need it to be a habit so you can get it done fast. You just, you don't want to go to the gym every day, but if you want to be ripped, you do go to the gym every day, right? You do mm. eat right. You don't eat the cake. This is like that, but just for sales and business development and entrepreneurship. And I'll just clarify it. This podcast, this book, you don't have to have the title of I work in sales to get value from this. You should be doing this yeah. in anything. This can be, I want to start a podcast and get the best guests on a podcast. This can be, I want to start a brand and I'm a PT. Or it can be any kind of business that you have. You can apply this to it. You don't have to have the title of sales manager or sales executive to be to be taking this and applying it in your life 100 percent. yeah i mean i'm not into i'm not in sales but i work in consulting as a full-time job and do it as like kind of entrepreneurship side hustle thing on the side so i can apply it to both things even though i'm not directly nice. into sales and then one thing i also wanted to mention is that i've even read and done this myself kept a day book kind of but not for business contacts but for personal contacts because I'm going to be totally mm. honest. I sometimes talk to friends. They tell me what they're up to. And when I meet them the next time, two months later, I forgot a lot of what they told me, you know, which is probably totally normal. But for me, it has worked to just write down a few key points, like what they told me, what they're up to, what holidays they're going on or whatever, as you said. And then next time I can follow up easily. I can look at my notes. It's like two minutes, not even and then it can simply follow up. So as you said, it doesn't just apply to salesperson. It also applies to everybody else. You just need to find the way how you can apply it to yourself. And that's brilliant. Not only does it help you, but it helps you show them that you care about them. Exactly. Because you're going, and that's the transition. It's like that puts you at the other level because the fact is you do have that way of retaining that information. You have a system for it. But that means that when you go and have that meet up with that friend, you can go and remember the the cool stuff that they told you that they're really excited about, mm. that they, they've now progressed. And you can remember those details. Like, oh, hang on, Timo really cares about me. He really understands what I'm going after. And that that's the power. That's where it's you become a super connector. Right. 
So how do you keep that daybook? Do you have a physical one or like online? Do you use a Google sheet yeah. or do you have a, a software for it? For me, and I, I, there are some free downloads with the book, which would include that template. So anyone that gets the book can basically go online and I'll give you a template to work with. Um, but for me, yeah, I honestly, it's online, it's Google Sheets, and it's also physical. I have a journal in my bag the whole time, everywhere. Mm. I've like, I will have, I've had two laptops in my bag and a journal, probably the heaviest bag in the world for years. Because I just, I need this stuff with me because if I get ideas, it needs to be on this one. If I get this, I want to be on here. I've got them. I mean, so today I've got lots of things in the bag, but like books, journals, everything needs to come with me all the time. Google Sheets, like it's all there because I want to be doing this on the fly, capturing the information, uploading it on Google Sheets. There are obviously CRM tools and, and things like that, that, that seem, once you get in the bowels of a big organization, the red tape comes in the difference in how you're supposed to kind of what information is important changes. Because remember for a company, the information they want to capture versus the information and details that you want to capture could be different. So this is almost like your personal treasure trove of information. It's those details that seem insignificant that make a ton of difference on the personal side. So I'd say Google sheets notes on your phone and um, a physical journal, because you want to get into the habit of writing daily, Mm. just having that, connection to paper writing daily is is a beautiful thing awesome yeah that's that's interesting and i think the combination of those mediums is what makes it the smoothest and and easiest yeah yeah it's fluid yeah exactly so uh looking at the time i want to jump over the next two steps which is um the M and the E of the model, which is uh, motivation and energy. I don't want to go to N, which is nailing the pitch. And mm. I'm interested in like, first, how do you prepare the perfect pitch, quote unquote? Mm. And I think this is this is something that I I definitely struggle with because when I was negotiating, right, right it was all verbal. There's no need really for decks and all this kind of stuff. You, it's It's like, it's a hardcore conversation or it can be. Um, and it's more about the nonverbal language and it's all of this. You're reading the room, you're re- it's verbal. So when you go into sales, obviously there's, if you're pitching a VC or you're pitching, you have to remember that the pitch starts way, way before. It starts an in negotiation. It starts way, way before. It's the beginning. Every interaction you're having is part of that pitch. It's right at the beginning. So you're able to influence from every, everything, from how you sit in the room, from how you greet people to how you treat people on the way in, like the whole thing matters and that's why it has to become part of your character Mm -hmm. but if you're someone and this is what trips people up is the nervousness before a pitch because it's a big deal right we've got millions of dollars on the line or even if it's just a small client that could mean a lot of money to you or business to you or it matters whatever it matters to you and you don't want to mess it up and the problem is is we think that we have to have it perfect we think that we have to go slide by slide and then what happens is in those big conversations Naturally, someone will come in within five minutes and scupper the whole thing and ask the question that you have answered on the last slide at the beginning, and I want to know that. And then because it didn't go the way you thought and you put all this effort in, the victim will take over or the the fear takes over, and then you're like, oh, my goodness, we've got to go there, and how do I explain it? So there's a fluidity to it. So what I like to do is you want to you want to have your pitch down, but you also want to go for things like go for a run and just start running because you're simulating your heart beating a bit faster and it's totally natural. That's the other thing. Don't worry if you get nervous and your heart beats fast before you go into pitch, totally natural. Mm. But what you want to understand is that that doesn't mean fear. You want to change that fear into excitement, right? Everybody, no matter how big, if their speakers on big stages and they've got 7,000 people in front of you, they all feel nervous before it's how they manage that and how they meditate and they connect to their deeper purpose. They connect to within and what, what they're doing is they're serving. And you're doing the same thing in entrepreneurship and sales. You're going out and you're serving that audience or that person. You're not there to just, oh, I have to convince them and I'm a failure if I can't do it. And everyone's looking at me and I really need this. And don't blow up what this means because it's not it's not even going to happen, number one. And number two, you can rip up the rule book anytime you want. You can get the deck down if you don't feel like the deck that you're presenting is working or it's hitting home stop the deck play a game get some get some life in and this this depends on the culture as well so i will say like i mean doing business in japan and different countries there are different ways that you need to be 
aware of that things are going mm. on around you that, that you can't just rush things and but you need to still be you in that situation and you need to remember that like this isn't life or death and the best you you can be is the one that shows up authentically and that knows their stuff so go on a run get your heart rate going and, and just speak out the slide speak out your patter ask that question and then respond ask and just get into the rhythm of it so that then you're able to do it on the fly and you can go you don't have to be able to do the whole thing all the way through. It's like when you're practicing for a speech that you're going to give to an audience. You just want to be able to take a bit of it and then take take the next bit and just keep rotating mm. so that you can do it at the drop of a hat and you can just get that question answered at the drop of a hat and it feels effortless because it's the right answer. It's what you would say at any scenario. So, And then if you find yourself kind of panicking or it's not going right or the, the reaction in the room isn't how you want i think that's where mindset it goes right back to mindset because mm. you'll be surprised how big of a difference it makes if you can keep pushing through and you've got that grit and that tenacity then if you let if you suddenly let the what's going on out here the result of the room and i've had it right i've had speeches and presentations and, and things in my life years ago where you've got people looking at you and they almost want you to fail they're, they're waiting for you to trip up and you have to have that resolute mindset of like, that's not a thought I can entertain, right? Because I'm here to serve. I'm here for a bigger purpose. I'm here to serve. So yeah, I can feel your energy. I can feel that you're not impressed or you don't like this. Like, cool. But everyone's going to have haters. Everyone's going to have part, but part, and you're going to have people that absolutely love what you're doing. But the problem mm. is, do you love it? Do you love what, do you love? What's your intention with this meeting, right? And when you have that at your core, it defined it can you can open up and you can just deliver to the best of your ability and not worry about what's going on here you've got to manage what's going on in here because it's all about inner results and inner peace and when you have that and you're honestly you're able to the nerves die down and then you're able to deliver in your ease with the room and I'd then focus on the people that are giving you joy and are giving you the right responses you don't need to go and address too much the negativity just just leave it there it just doesn't matter it's a bit like losing the sale thing like hey cool mm -hmm. i brother i wish you love and joy cool but we're going to go over here and we're going to focus on winning and what we can do and possibility and open-mindedness and and those things so i'd say if it's not going right it can't really double down on your mindset and just put things in perspective and maybe maybe there's things you could have done better like prepared but also sometimes sometimes it won't right hmm. sometimes you will meet a dick and you will be there and they will be um they will be hard right and they will be putting you on the spot they will be asking the questions they will they'll be they'll be doing things in a rude way and unfortunately that's that's part of it but it's again you don't lower your standards hmm. and you're not there to convince them and like i must sell this person like sometimes it, it's totally fine like you're not there the need has gone because you're you've got you are valuable you've got business to go do and this is just one. And if you find that's happening and you find that they're psychologically like, cause there are some narcissists out there that will make you feel like you've got a really short window to do things. And Oh my goodness. Like my time's way more valuable than your time. It's like, just reset the bar. Like, no, no, no. Sorry. You thought we got half an hour for this. Mate. Oh, I've got 15 minutes, mate. I've got to get out of here. I've got 10 clients today. Like you don't have to stay with the situation that's being created. Don't play the game. Just mm. remember your value. Remember that you're there to serve. Remember your purpose and your deeper why. And whatever that is, for me, it's my family, my boys. Like, this is like, what can we go out and create today? And I want to be around other people that want to do that. And you start to attract those people just for, by the way you are. And actually, you get respect by showing up as that person, even when the situation isn't going right. Because other people in the organization, if someone is being not great to you, they will eat, they will come to you after and be like, hey, well, well, well handled. They'll give you respect. So. Mm -hmm. There are people watching, so don't don't worry. But it's how you, are you watching you? Are you proud of you? And I think that that comes back to self identity. Are you proud of you? So do things that make you yeah. proud. That's huge. Yeah, I love that. Amazing answer. And you 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 mentioned on family, and this is something I wanted to ask you because the last step of the model is more. And I also read Ed Milet's book, The Power of One More, which is kind of this yeah, mentality of yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. <laughs> so it's it's kind of this idea of if you want to outperform your competitors, if you want to get to the top 1%, you know, if you do one more than everybody else, your chances are a lot higher than 
those of the other competitors mm. so and my question would be like how do you balance or how do you handle taking care of all your personal responsibilities you know family kids other things yeah. you have to do your body your health and all of that while at the same time still trying to do more business wise mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's a there's a different pace to success, right? There's a different pace to winning. There's a different pace to when you've got really big goals and you should have big goals. Don't have goals that don't excite you. Get the big impossible goal in front of you. Get something that if it happened to you, you would get out of bed in a flash. If you were like, if this was happening, I'd be loving life. Make that your goal. Don't make something that's linear and just like, okay, we're going to go for 10 or 20% improvement because it's like no one's going to get excited by that. And you're not going to have these cool ideas that get you lit up. And that's the energy. And that's what Ed Milet talks about. Yes, he's talking about being able to do one more and push and expand out through brute, like through brute force and just having that mentality of the power of one more. But he's also saying about, you know, in my my understanding and like of it is you want that fire. You want you have big goals that make you excited, that connect deeply, intrinsic, emotionally into you. And so finding those drivers for me, it's my family and my wife and my sons and leading those boys to become men and growing them and, and showing them. I love this. This, I love being a best-selling author and having them see that they go into the store and they see daddy's books in whatever city yeah. we're in, in London and all these places. And you're just like, there is literally no better feeling. But the thing, the reason why is because they understand business and they understand that daddy is writing a book right now and then that oh and then that's what you did two years ago yep and now it's here oh and now that pays for this holiday or whatever it is like it's just mm. like and that oh and that helps this person and then that what now we're friends with this person or we got connected and it's like they see it all come together so i think with more for you when you're in the zone and you're there how do you balance everything well firstly you need to structure your time so that you're spending the quality be where you're at if you're on this podcast right now, we're on this podcast. We're not trying to like my phone's going up. I'm not looking at it. Like there's all these things There's people could be coming in, like whatever mm -hmm. you're here on this podcast. And then the next thing. And, and so there's a pace, right? There's a pace to it. So just because this podcast is done, it might be that we've got five others this day or there's the next meeting, next meeting or whatever it, we haven't. But I'm saying from here, I might go and take my kids to the playground. Then I might have a call in New York at eight o'clock. Then I might, and it doesn't, doesn't necessarily stop. And you mm -hmm. might go, I might go to the gym, right? And then I'm emailing people in between reps and I'm listening to another podcast. In So basically it's how you stack the wins throughout your day. I was up at 4.30 this morning, but that's been my habit for many, many years, right? Mm -hmm. And so up at 4.30, I've already been to the gym once today. So it's like, how do you do it? Well, I still might go to the gym again. Like it's top and tail. It's like 75 hard and Andy Frisella. Like mm -hmm. these, these things are here for a reason. People are showing you how to do it. It's, it's a bit, and I'm sure, I think you have done 75 hard, right? Like uh, it's yeah, yeah. at the beginning, it's super hard to see how you can fit that into your life. And then halfway mm -hmm. through about day, like 50 or something, you're just like, yeah, I'm a machine. I can do 25 got this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It feels very different. Right. And it's the same yeah. thing with more. Mm -hmm. You thinking that you need the conditions to be perfect, to send that email, to make that ask, to make that request, to do the thing that is going to surprise and delight. I've, I've sent, clients that i know are working to one two three a.m in the morning in hong kong i've sent them roasted goose when i'm not even in hong kong right because i know they're still in the office and i know they love bloody goose so they've got a goose coming to them and i've organized that so, i mean it sounds crazy but this is the stuff you do it because this is what is more it's about going the extra mile and showing people that you care and so making sure that you are, are there in the situation you know what's important to you it's never a question of time because if it was important, you prioritize it. And then sticking to what is the fundamentals of what you need to do, which is why having a system like the momentum sales model is so important because it allows you to do more in itself. Mm, You're not just exactly. scrabbling. So doing the right things at the right time, doing nine before 9 a.m. and planting nine seeds and then setting myself a momentum sales challenge, like getting 25 meetings in every day, reaching out to 25 new clients and building that pathway to success. Like setting yourself a little challenge. I want to do a thousand push-ups today. Why? Because it makes me a machine up here. It doesn't mm. matter about a thousand push-ups. And then what does that do? Well, I want to do really big audacious goals. Like I want to cycle up this massive mountain in Oman when I didn't even do ride cycling. Like did that this year, right? It's, just, it's these things, we put things in our path that seem like more to actually create the mentality of someone that can carry that load of more. And then by doing that, 
Mm. You actually can. And then you're like, hang on. You mean this was all possible all the time? It's just I put the limitations on myself. So, yeah, more's all always there. Um, it just you're telling yourself you can't do it. Um, right. And then and you get hang out with other people that are doing it. You know, Patrick, but David, he's always about mm. outperform, out hustle, out outlast the competition. Like you get around other people that are putting out content that are feeding you the right things, and then you start feeding yourself the right talk, the talk track, and yeah. then um, you'll find the results start speaking for themselves. Love that. Yeah, it's an, and it's as Andy says in about the program seventy five hard. You know, if you can do it one day. You can do it seven. You can do it seventy-five days. So if you just right. focus on making it one day, then you can. You have the the blueprint of making it any day, basically. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's kind of getting into that. the habit of squeezing that in. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Well, awesome. So I have, I have two two last questions. Actually, basically just one last question for you that I ask any guest who's on because the show is called Power of Books, and we talk about you know, books you've written. I also want to mm. know like which books have impacted you the most. So maybe if you mm. can name one, two, oh, three yeah. that like, have impacted you. I mean, I spent a lot of my time studying wealth creation and mindset. And so obviously thinking grow rich, the science of get, getting rich by Wallace D Wattles, like those books were fundamental in the beginning. And I, and I do go back to them a lot. I mean, you were born rich by Bob Proctor. I love that for self-identity. Um, Mandino. I, li I literally reread books again and again and again. I probably have a core 20 books that I will mm. just imprint in my mind. Um, the greatest salesman in the world. Like, I love, I like, love these books, like The Alchemist. Like these are the they, they make sense in together, right? And you start to kind of just they, if yeah. they hit you in your core, you you feel very um alive i mean uh, if i'm feeling like i need some extra grit then i'll go to, to goggins and can't hurt me or I'll, I'll go in that that direction um yeah. and i'll go and read that again um but i think i think it's those that help you have a higher enlightenment enlightenment and self-awareness that's what i've really found is the authors that i i love uh, uh, yeah napoleon hill is it speaks to my soul but then so does things like it depends on the time and what I've been going through right. that whether it um whether it's needed so it's it's about almost being able to have the tool for the situation that you need mm. you know what you need and you're like right I need a bit of this today exactly. but yeah I'm constantly constantly um feeding my mind even Ben Hardy he sent me a bunch of his new books like you know the um 10x is is easier than mm -hmm. 2x like his new book with dan sullivan and like that's that's great and and sometimes it takes someone else to say it in different words for you to get it as well because that that totally it's great for um understanding and that's really about self-identity and abundance and just understanding impossible goals which speaks back into bob proctor's work and back into napoleon hill's work so napoleon hill you know bob based his whole life on napoleon hill's work and it, 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 everyone's kind of got a blueprint that they're following the next blueprint and the next blueprint up and right. um and hopefully i've done that for some people with my books and that's kind of how it's been it's kind of like you take the, what what you can see from someone else and then try and push the conversation a little bit further in mm. in the perspective that you have so it's been yeah you had your experience on top of it basically and then right give that on to the next generation basically yeah yeah that's it that's absolutely that. it. Yeah, some great. I, I don't know if you've read Un "Unreasonable Hospitality" by Will Gadara. Um, I haven't. I haven't yet, but I have, uh, I've heard book, so many great th things about it. Will yeah. is amazing, yeah. and that book is, is, he's uh, applying it to obviously the restaurant hospitality business, but mm -hmm. there's a lesson in, in sales in that book and and just customer service, like it's phenomenal. Gotta give it a read for sure. So to to finish up, where can people buy your stuff, buy, buy your book, basically, or learn mm. more about you, get more information, <laughs> and so on? Yeah, if anyone wants to, to hop on to my website, uh, timjscastle.com, most of the courses that I... Like, I recommend the courses because it allows more... Like, books are great. Books are great. But anyone that really wants to tap into this, mm. go get the course as well, and it's going to complement the book. Yeah. Um, so my website's gonna be good for that. Uh Amazon, 
Tim Castle, the art of negotiation, be the lion, the momentum sales model, the art of decision making. It, they're all there um, under my name, podcast, Tim Castle show on every podcast platform. And then Instagram is, I mean, I mainly hang out on Instagram. Um, so yeah, at Tim JS Castle is my, is my handle as my handle on everything. So just, you yeah. can Google that, but yeah, I'd love to hear from people and if I can help in any way with coaching or whatever it is, I'm here to help with questions. Um, let, let's go, let's do it. Love it. Love it. And I'm going to link all the things you mentioned in the show notes so people can directly access it if they are looking for it. Nice. So well, good. Tim, I loved our conversation today. So many great insights and lessons you shared. Love the book. And yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today and, and do this interview together. No, thank you so much, Timo. Thank you. You've been a blessing and thank you for having me on and um, for helping me kind of speak to your audience and I hope this touches touches lives and people that might be needing a bit of help but also if you're not and you just want to elevate um get in touch but yeah thank you my man I love your work and I know we've been in contact for quite a long time you've been, it's been yeah a couple been, of years already you've been you've been yeah. part of this journey so it's, it's great <laughs> great yeah. I love it same man well I appreciate you and thank you guys for listening and see you next time